So now we are going to start with uh, module two. So you've all uh, had a chance to, to listen in on module one. So there's a reason why it's called garbage in and garbage out, because if you don't have your input tissue in their best form, um, there's really nothing much of uh, what your fancy or the most sophisticated of your computational analysis can do. <clears throat> so now we're gonna jump straight into module two. So I'm gonna take you through some pre-processing steps. So these are the learning objectives. So you will be understanding, I've decided to give some time, kind of uh, take you through in understanding your output files. So you might have noticed there's a whole bunch of files that is given out by the machine after it's run. So we just want to go through that briefly and just state that this is basically a generic set of files that is kind of uh, given. I do want you, I would like you to know and be aware of the file formats and their use cases and know the contents of your file outputs. So now we are in pre-processing steps. So we are going to be uh, doing part A, part B, and part C. So I'm going to be starting out with a short lecture. All right. And then we'll do a bit of, uh, we'll do quite a bit of uh, hands-on. I'm trying to keep my lecture as short as possible so that you will get to work with your files and data because I think that's how you practice. I don't need to yak and yak about things that you can obviously read because you're all intelligent. So I don't need to, to underestimate that. So the files that you should be familiar with. So if you want a full review of every single file and the format and what it contains, you can follow this website and it will take you to it. So on the right is all the output files that you see. And pretty much this is not unique to the Xenium. So most of what I'm about to talk is applicable to other platforms as well. So this is just to give you that, that insight into what uh, you should be able to understand. So what I've done is I've taken these 23 um, files on your right, and I've kind of uh, split them up into these broad groups. So basically, your output has got your gene expression files, and you have your images, right? So now, if you perform um, cell staining, you're going to have more than that. Beat. But if it's just the standard Xenium run or any kind of standard runs, you only have that beat. And then you have your transcripts file. So they've given you uh, transcripts.csv, transcripts.parket, and then transcripts.zar. There's nothing to be afraid of these uh, extensions. They're just different formats. So I personally like to use and load the transcripts.parket file. In fact, I like to load parket files in general. They kind of, they're faster, they're more memory efficient, but it's just that some of the segmentation methods that are out there, for example, um, base or it's kind of convenient because the code uses a CSV file. All right. And then you have your image files, which is often in TIFF format. Now the OM is just a standardized way. All right. It's a universal way of trying to package your images. All right. It doesn't always work very well, but usually most of your image analysis software should be able to take on this OMT files, all right? Now, from your transcripts file is how you get your cells feature matrix. So your transcripts file has got the coordinates for each transcript, all right? Now, your cells feature <laughs> matrix is basically summing up your transcripts for each gene and then putting it, putting it um, into cells. So you have each row, which is a cell, and then you have your features, your genes. Now, of course, this is an imaging-based system, so you will expect your segmentation files. Now, what is obvious is that you will see in, in your Xenium or whether it's Merscope is that you'll see these boundaries, right? But before they draw or they get these geometries, you will have your segmentation mask. These are the original masks, all right, 
So these are like binary files, all right? From these binary files is how you get your predicted single cell polygons. This is the same, not just for the Xenium, not just for Mosco or any of your single cell platforms. It is also true, even if let's say you're doing image analysis using Salpos, MERSMA, you need the segmentation mask, all right? But usually the polygons are drawn out and they come in the form of CSV or JSON files. So that's what mostly you need to be using for basic analysis. Now the original segmentation files, segmentation mask, they are found in your cells.zar file. All right, you don't need to extract them unless you're not happy, all right, or you want a, a better or a, or a finer single cell polygons, all right, then you can extract it and you can compute your JSON files again. So you have your single cell polygons, which are coming from your segmentation mask, and these will be stored in your, and these will actually form your cells. Dot. So finally, you have your cells.csv file, which is going to give you all of your metadata associated with your single cells, all right? And just remember that from your single cell polygons, which are coming from your segmentation mask, you have estimates of your boundaries, all right? So these are basically polygons with vertices. So you will get X, Y coordinates of the, of the vertices of these geometries, and these will be stored in your cell boundaries or your nucleus boundaries file. So you will see later, because I will be um, going through uh, the script where you will plot some of these files, and you will see the actual geometries, which I think is important. So, <clears throat> so for gene expression analysis, all right, the two things that you really need importantly is just your cell feature matrix. So for all of those, all those of you who have done um, single cell analysis, your feature matrix is, uh, is, is equivalent to your feature matrix that you find from your single cell. And then you will need, of course, um, additional uh, coordinate system. You, need, you will need additional information such as your coordinate, uh, what do you call it, framework, and that's going to come from your cells.csv file. And then from your image analysis, all right, these are the files that you will be using. So it's pretty much you have your image-based files and you have your gene expression files. And this is pretty much generic. Why do I say it's generic? If you were to look at an image analysis like Comet or AMC, it's going to end up giving you kind of like the same uh, formats, except that you'll have uh, protein, uh, what do you call it, um, expression levels instead of gene expression levels. <clears throat> All right. So this is what I want you to understand because there's no point in memorizing. If you understand the formats, you can use any kind of object. So you can use your SURAT object or you can use your scan by object. So today, what we're gonna do is, instead of simply just using the cell feature matrix and the cells.csv file and forming your end data object for gene expression analysis, we're gonna take a step back. We're gonna start with the transcripts.csv file or the transcripts.parquet file. And then you're going to derive your cell feature matrix file. And you're going to derive your centroids, your total counts, and your gene counts. And you're going to form your end data object from there. And then you're going to do your gene expression. And the reason for doing that is because I would like you to take a look at what the transcripts files are about and how they are manipulated, all right, so that you have a better understanding. Because the thing is, sometimes some of your spatial analysis methods, you will have to start with your transcripts file. So it's best that you understand. And it's also good to understand how your data looks like before the cleanup, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, for the hands-on session. Okay, so we're going to jump, all right, right now into uh, the practical. All right. That was my run. That's the control probe distribution in a bad run. And 
I know that Farzani remember the the tissue that expanded. Yeah. So remember, if you listen to module one, that time to test your your listening. So if you listen to module one, and uh, Melanie brought this up. There is there are sometimes where if your fixation is not for, is not good enough, your tissue expands, and that that is exactly what happened to my tissue. So my mouse brain basically just expanded. But the run wasn't so bad, right? The run actually wasn't so bad. So I was very happy and I was very, very confident that it would be fine. I can still salvage my gene expression. But the thing is, it wasn't, it wasn't so. So the thing is, we, I, I don't know much about the dynamics of these control probes, but they're very much akin to your negative probes, all right, or your control probes that any of you would have designed when you wanted to knock down a gene. They will have all the flaws, right? Many of the flaws, many of the, um, what do you call it, uh, batch effects when, when you actually design your probes. And it's the same here, all right? So this is just one way, all right, for you to check the quality of your tissue. And the thing is, I have also noticed something else, another use for these uh, QE values and also for the distribution of your transcripts. This was a good run. It went really well. But the thing is, the density of my transcripts is actually very much lopsided. Okay. Now we take it for granted. All right. We really take it for granted um, that um, what do you call it? If a run is good, it's going to give me uh, the results that I want. But the thing is, in this case, I have a confounding factor. One area is less dense. And this can actually give rise to my downstream analysis bias, such as the clustering on the right that I did. So now I have to question my clustering, whether the clustering that I see here is biased because of the uh, counts all right, that I see. And the thing is, we do not have the power of numbers that we have from single cell sequencing. 500 genes is nothing. Having 200, 500 counts per cell is nothing. So our normalization effects, our biases that we introduce, all right, because of all these micro, all right, um, affectations that might exist in your tissue. And anyone who has done uh, imaging would know that this resembles the H effect that many of us see when we do image staining, when the antibody or when the regions are not well distributed. All right? So it's just a small little exercise. So now we are going to go straight into analyzing your data. Okay? Now, tidying and evaluating your data set. So we're going to be doing this in your practical, all right, later on. Uh, no, before we, um, no, you're going to do this now, all right. So before we go on to analyzing for gene expression, normalizing your data, doing your dimensional reduction, and understanding your interesting data, the next thing is we would like to put this all into a container. So... We all have our favorite uh, languages. We all have our favorite uh, containers. I don't really like R very much. Sorry for all those R enthusiasts. <laughs> all right. But I really like Python. Um, so I use N data. Um, so if you want to use CURET, go ahead and use uh, CURET. I'm nothing against them. But yeah. So we will take these. All right. And we are going to form our N data. So 